Next, we speak one-on-one -on -one with Congressman Rodney Davis on health care and tax reform and how working with President Trump compares to working with President Obama. We also hear his ideas on immigration and rebuilding the military. This runs about 40 minutes. Congressman Rodney Davis, thanks for joining us again on the Illinois Channel. Thanks for having me, Terry. We are, uh, I think, day 50, if I recall, that uh, Donald Trump has now been in the White House. Uh, you served under, came in under President Obama. How is working with the White House different, if you can say, under President Trump versus President Obama? Well, it's, it's been just over a month, and it's, it's much different. Uh, I served four years with the president from my home state. I uh, met him uh, while he was leaving the State of the Union during my first term, told him I'm more than willing to work together on a lot of issues. Uh, but we really never had the opportunity to go to the White House and, and sit down and talk about substantive issues. As a matter of fact, I've never even seen the Oval Office in person. Um, Donald Trump and his administration over the last week and a half, though, Terry, uh, has had me and others over at the White House to talk about policy. I joined my fellow deputy whip team members just last week for a meeting with the president and the vice president to talk about health care reform and where we were told that, uh, you know, he was 100 percent behind our our plan that was being released that week. And it was great to be able to get to meet him in a small group setting. And I can see why he's president of the United States. You know, he's the first person. Uh... I think ever to be president without having any government uh, experience, but I don't know, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Mm -hmm. Well, I know in my lifetime that's the case, and, and I, I talk about that a lot, that this is somebody who came from the private sector. He's truly a, a Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Uh, he's used to doing things in a different way than those of us in government are used to doing. It's going to be a different learning curve for him compared to, to somebody who had been a governor like George W. Bush or a U.S. senator like Barack Obama. Um, so he's got some, some different, uh, different styles. Uh, you know, frankly, there are times I wish he wouldn't tweet as much. But he knows that he can get his message out directly to the American people. And frankly, when the 24-hour news coverage continues to, to cover every tweet, why not use it? because you're going to exponentially grow whatever message that you want to put out there. I think he's done some things um, already in a short time that don't get enough attention, and then some things that, that do get too much. What, what is not getting enough attention? Uh, some of the regulatory reform that we've been able to pass through the House under the Congressional Review Act, things that have cost so many consumers uh, uh, so much money and they don't even know it because it's a cost that's put onto them by our financial institutions, by our, our small businesses. So we've reduced the cost of compliance and not affected the regulatory environment. Um, and we've done it in a way that's going to be positive for every single American. And that hasn't been given enough, to, hasn't been given enough attention in the first month and a half of the Trump presidency. Yeah, one of the uh, committees that you're on agriculture, I believe, uh, and one of the issues that really has bothered a lot of farmers uh, that started under the Obama administration was the WOTUS, the Waters of the United States, and how the EPA was looking to change uh, some of the definitions of to basically expand their regulatory power. Fill us in on what was that and what did the president do relative to the effort by EPA to expand their regulation? Well, the Waters of the U.S. rule was a rule that was implemented by the Obama administration to give the EPA unprecedented powers over, over what we would consider our waterways, like the Mississippi and Illinois rivers, um, also our lakes and our streams. But it would also give them authority over drainage ditches and drainage swales that we see in neighborhoods throughout this country. Um, that's something that, in my opinion, was an overreach. And I've had the chance to ask the EPA administrators, deputy administrators, about how they're going to implement this rule. And they could never, ever give me a straight answer on simple questions. I would urge you to go to my website. You could probably still see the video. I asked the EPA administrator herself twice and deputy administrators two other times the exact same question and couldn't get a response. Uh, that was the last administration's goal was, in my opinion, overreach. So what we did under the new administration, we worked with President Trump to repeal that rule, and it's now not a rule any longer. That's another 
Thank, that was done with the executive order, wasn't it? Yeah, the it? executive order. Uh, we, well, the executive order was then going through the rulemaking process, too. Um, and we were able to repeal those things, repeal the rule uh, that was the Waters of the U.S. rule uh, as part of our Congressional Review Act. Now, and, this is where some people were saying, see, already the administration is uh, diminishing EPA standards, but they may not understand that if you were putting fertilizer on your lawn in a neighborhood and a spring rain came along and washed some of that into a ditch, the EPA could have come in and fined the neighborhood, ordered an EPA study on the economic or the environmental impact, right? I mean, this is the kind of thing that, as you were Absolutely. saying, there was so much ambiguity, and that sounds like an overreach, but it really was a potential threat that you could have your neighborhood association fined, uh, or a farmer who has water standing in his field the EPA would all of a sudden call that puddle a wetland and have definition for it, it would have, it would have created economic havoc. Right? Well, it would have created chaos, especially in our agricultural community, even in our transportation community. Imagine trying to build a, a road or a bridge uh, with, with increased, um, you know, increased uh, exposure to you know, the EPA being able to, to stop those projects that are, that are good for our, our economy and good for uh, creating good paying jobs. Uh, but in this case, Terry, uh, this was a common sense fix to a problem that was created by the executive branch and by bureaucrats that sit in concrete buildings in Washington, D.C. Uh, we were never able to get straight answers out of the EPA. And this WOTUS rule was supposed to be a clarification of the Clean Water Act. And it was anything but a clarification. And if you go look at the video I was talking about where I asked the same question, it was a question in regards to septic systems. You know, many in my district in rural America have to rely upon a septic system to be able to flush their toilets and take a shower. Now, the state of Illinois, in conjunction with the US EPA, had implemented a permitting process just a few short years ago. Matter of fact, I asked the question as to, are these septic systems going to be exempt under the sewage treatment facilities provision in the WOTUS rule? And every single time I asked that question, the EPA administrator or associate administrator said, we don't regulate septic systems. And I would hold up a, a, a packet of frequently asked questions that were distributed by the EPA, their regional office here in the Midwest, on how, how to get a permit. I said, what do you mean? If you don't actually require a permit, why do I have your frequently asked questions? Why don't you figure out what's going on in your district offices instead of coming here and telling us something we know is not true? So that's why, that's just a one example as to why this rule needed to be repealed, and we did that, and I'm proud of President Trump for signing that into law. I want to get to some other issues, but while we're on this, this goes to one of my main problems with how our system works, and we elect people such as yourself to be a congressman, you have the authority to make law based upon the will of the people by virtue of the fact that you hold office. But when we have these regulatory agencies going off on their own, like the Lone Ranger, and making new rules that have the effect of law, it, it really kind of breaks down the whole moral basis for having the people being ruled by the federal government when you have unelected people in the bureaucracy who can skirt even the powers of Congress uh, uh, unless you have an enormous uh, pushback. And I don't know to what extent Congress ever says, you know, maybe we need to have a committee on what's going on in the regulatory bodies just to make sure that they're implementing the laws the way we intended them to be implemented. Well, you're absolutely right. You know, bureaucrats in concrete buildings in Washington shouldn't come up with ideas that cost taxpayers billions of dollars. Uh, as a matter of fact, remember not too long ago, uh, some geniuses at the EPA came up with an idea to regulate milk spills the same way they would regulate oil spills. And there was nobody in that room around that conference table that raised their hand and said, hang on a second, which one can you clean up with cats? <laughs> you know, there's, you got to have some common sense. It's, it's rules like that that were proposed that I then, as a policymaker, am forced to try and fix. Like I put into the 2014 Farm Bill 
a new uh, agricultural standing committee for the EPA Science Advisory Board. So hopefully we can get a, people in the ag community around a table to be that person to raise their hand when someone comes up with an idea like that. Now, when you look at the rulemaking process, the Obama administration, it seemed as though they knew they could not get legislative successes because of their failures at the ballot box. They wanted to put their agenda in, into, uh, into law through that rulemaking process. And we now have to pull back that exponential increase that we saw in the rulemaking process one by one. And we're doing that with the most egregious ones first. And I'm not a fan of executive orders either. I don't care if you're a Republican president or a Democrat president. But one executive order that doesn't get enough attention that the president put in place is that he's requiring agencies before they implement a new rule to offer two outdated ones to repeal. And those are common sense provisions that I hope we can put into law rather than seeing it through an executive order in the future. Well, and right now, at least as far as uh, making immediate changes as fast as possible, his executive orders can put a halt to some of this, and then the Congress in their own t- t- time uh, can, as you say, implement that in the law so it becomes yeah, more permanent, not a temporary thing. Let's go on. So, two of the major issues, uh, there's, there's a handful of them, we'll hopefully we'll get to them, but obviously the tax code, the rewrite, and uh, health care. Which, in your mind, is, if you have to make the uh, choice between, which would you think Congress should be addressing first? Well, regardless of what I prefer, we're going to address health care first because it's part of budget reconciliation. Budget reconciliation is an arcane process that we in the House have to follow because of the Senate rules. And what it allows us to do is to avoid a filibuster so that we can pass good common sense laws with a majority vote rather than trying to get 60. When you see that... The so let's, I'm going to stop just because I want us to walk through because we hear these terms. So what is the reconciliation process, if you can just... Well, the reconciliation process is a process that we had to begin in the House to implement, and we did so. And what it allows us to do is to, uh, is to pass bills that have zero impact on the deficit and zero impact on the debt, it allows us to pass them in a majority-only fashion in the Senate. Now, usually the Senate can be bogged down by filibusters if you don't get 60 votes. Right. And what It takes 60 votes to end a filibuster, so the minority can hold up a bill from passage. They can hold up a bill from passage. This reconciliation process was the process that was used to pass Obamacare. And this process is going to be the same one that we used to repeal it and to begin the replacement and the repair process. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. We've introduced our plan that fits within the budget reconciliation rules. I would like to do a lot more in our initial plan to make our health care system better, but we're going to have to do uh, two other steps to make that happen. And that's, let me insert here. So one of the, because I think, you know, we have such divide even within the Republican ranks. Uh, Jim Jordan was, you know, saying on the Sunday talk shows as we tape this uh, that we ought to be starting over and do what the people elected us to do. We are. But, well, and that's the thing. I Tell us about the three-step process. So as an example, everyone in the Republican Party was running and saying we ought to have insurance sold across state lines because it would be more competition. Mm-hmm. If you're living in Illinois and someone in Washington State, an insurance firm has a bigger, a better policy, I should be able to buy the policy out of Washington State or Florida or somewhere else and not just be limited to uh, insurance companies. And yet that right now is not part of the health care rewrite. So people look at this and go, why isn't that, as one example, part of the bill? So take us through this, again, not to be arcane, but the process, what is the three-part process we already said through the reconciliation, you've got, what is it, I think 50, I forget if it's 51 or 52 votes uh, in the Senate, so you can pass it if you need to just with Republicans. I'll, I'll be quiet. T- tell us uh, what you would tell to those people who say the Republicans are not uh, doing what they said they were going to be doing on repealing Obamacare. Well, first off, the Democrats, uh, both in the House and the Senate, have shown no willingness to want to sit down and fix a broken health care system that even former President Bill Clinton uh, said needed to be fixed just a few short months ago. So that requires us to look ahead at that reconciliation process that we just mentioned. We 
The reconciliation process is a process that forced us to design a health care reform bill that's going to pass the parliamentary muster once it gets over to the Senate. Now, I would love to put provisions in like association health plans, uh, being able to sell uh, health policies across state lines to open up the risk pools and make more competition. But that's not going to fit into the Senate's arcane budgetary process. And my colleagues, like my friend Jim Jordan, know this. They knew this going in. Um, we've got to use the budget reconciliation process as step one. Step two is Secretary Price, one of my former colleagues, a, a medical doctor by profession. He's going to utilize his powers that were given to him under Obamacare through the regulatory process to allow for more competition. And a simultaneous third step that we're going to be able to work on is to do those things that we also promised by allowing that insurance to be sold across state lines, by allowing associations to band together and some of the popular provisions. We're going to do this in a virtually simultaneous fashion. But there are a lot in my party that campaigned on repealing and replacing and repairing Obamacare in 2010 before I got to Washington, in 2014, in 2016. And the president actually campaigned on that too. The president at a meeting we had at the White House last week said he is 100% behind our three-step process. And it's going to be up to the president, the vice president, to help us get Republican votes to ensure that we move the process forward. And I'm very confident that we'll be able to continue to work with the White House to actually make that happen. Yeah, not to have you editorialize on the motivations, but I just wonder what's driving these comments because they should understand the process. Obviously, these other congressmen should know what's going on. I just don't understand the nature of them. In the 24-hour news cycle, I'm sure you can probably go back and find comments of some of those same individuals saying that we have to repeal and replace at the same time and now saying we should do repeal only. Remember, there are a lot of folks in my in my Republican conference that have been the loyal opposition to President Obama, and they voted no on virtually every major piece of legislation that we passed in the four years that I'd been there. They've got to change their philosophy now as part of the governing party. Instead of the opposition party, we as Republicans, since we have control of the White House and both branches of Congress, we have to be the proposition party. And it's going to take a little while for some of my colleagues to actually be able to get to that point. But I think this health care bill is the bill that will be able to move them over, and I think they'll be supportive in the end. What is the timeline that you're being told the health care bill would be passed? Well, we're hopeful that we'll be able to pass it out of the House by the end of the month, and then it'll go to the Senate which obviously, because of their arcane rules, will take much longer. And simultaneously, I think, maybe not, uh, the tax code, is that being worked on uh, uh, as well within the, say, Ways and Means Committee? Uh, it is. It is. And, and remember, uh, i got to give Paul Ryan and our leadership team a lot of credit. In the midst of the presidential election, they wanted us Republican members to sit down and put together our agenda. And we did that. It's called the Better Way Agenda. Go visit better.gop and you can see all of the different frameworks for our ideas if we were to get a Republican president and a Republican Senate and a Republican House. Well, the American people gave us that. And we already did the work, six months of planning, to put that agenda together, that framework. And we're now able to implement those into bills which we can begin to, instead of, we can go from the blueprint stage to actually picking out what we want. It's like building a house. You don't pick out the color of carpet or the paint on the walls until you've got the frame up. And we had to develop that framework before the presidential election. We did that. Now we've been able to put our details into a bill that we released last week that will also go through the legislative process. And that legislative process, I guarantee you, will, be ch will offer up some other changes that will hopefully make it better. My goal is to have more affordability, more accessibility in our health care system because we've got to fix a system in place that is already collapsing. The status quo is going to cost Illinois in two years hundreds of millions of dollars if we do nothing. In Obamacare. In Obamacare. Uh, we, under President Obama, the economy never grew, GDP never grew 3%, which is 
He's the only president since World War II that hasn't had so, uh, at least one year of 3% growth. And we see any number of people where businesses are stagnating or they, they just can't expand. It's not, it's like as I tell people, a plane going down the tarmac, but it never gets enough speed to take off. Your estimation is that once we pass this tax code that this will lead to a faster growing economy and therefore mean more jobs and coincidentally more tax revenues to the federal government. I do believe that and we've got our framework in place for tax reform. Uh, there are those who are economic experts uh, who have already uh, who have already said that our tax plan uh, as we will propose it could lead upwards to lead upwards of four percent economic growth GDP growth that's that's unheard of compared to what we saw in the last administration. But we have had that. I mean, under Reagan, I think we had years where we even had 5% growth. And, and under so. Reagan, yes. Um, and But we didn't see that under the Obama administration. Right. And I don't think it's a coincidence that once the administration changed hands, you saw consumer confidence begin to rise. And we need to continue to take advantage of that by reforming the antiquated tax code. Not We Republicans haven't just run on repealing, replacing, and repairing Obamacare. We've also run on making the tax code fl fairer, flatter, and simpler. And we would be abdicating our responsibilities and breaking our campaign promises that we made to our voters if we didn't do these things. And I'm optimistic, um, along with the speaker, that we'll be able to see both of these packages uh, law by, by the time summer's over. Another major issue, I mean, we could, I'd, I'd love to spend more time, but I want to get some of our other issues. Uh, one, before I get into immigration, uh, let's talk you also on transportation. Yeah. The president, you know, I, I think because the president engages in some behavior that is annoying, he'll, he'll go off and make these tweets that I think distract from the major issues. But here's a guy who's a builder. I mean, that's his whole life. And he's talked about in the campaign the poor infrastructure of the United States. You and I have talked before about the need for new locks and dams on the Mississippi and the Illinois River. Uh, the president wants to put money into infrastructure projects. With that in mind, his infrastructure bill, what, what are you looking at? What difference would the average person maybe see in transportation if we kind of project maybe in a five to ten year period going forward? Well, I, I was excited when President Trump talked about infrastructure. As a matter of fact, I saw a chart of issues that we Republicans were going to address laid out at our retreat in January. And uh, when the president saw that, he wanted infrastructure moved up further, uh, closer, uh, rather than in uh, 2018. He wanted to address it in 2017. And you're right, he's a builder. He's somebody who understands that if you want to create economic growth, you've got to invest in our roads and our bridges and our, our crumbling infrastructure. And he promised a lot of workers, a lot of folks, that may not have voted Republican in the past. He promised them that he was going to invest in infrastructure. And that puts our good men and women in the trades and labor forces back to work. Now, what does this mean? People will say, well, that's no different than President Obama's stimulus bill. Well, President Trump's proposed bill is going to be a lot different. Number one, when you look at the, the Obama economic stimulus bill, it borrowed a trillion dollars on the backs of the next generation and it only invested about 6% in infrastructure. There's story after story of, of government money going to companies that have since filed bankruptcy. One just recently in the, in the news just this past week. We're hoping to invest a trillion dollars in infrastructure, not just 6% of a trillion dollars. We want to see real growth, and we want to make sure that we put a plan forth that's going to actually do what it's intended to do to put men, good men and women in our trades and labor force back to work to get good paying jobs and get them back to a job and a career that they have trained for. One of the, one of the executive orders also that the president engaged was uh, to bring back the Keystone Pipeline Project, which Absolutely. had been uh, X'd out by President Obama. Um, 40,000 jobs the most studied project in American history. I stood on the floor of the House before the President, President Obama, made his, his famous, I've got a pen and a phone speech. Uh, I had a picture of his pen. I said, pick that pen up if you want to create real economic opportunity in America. And we had the support of, 
of the carpenters, of the laborers, of the operating engineers, those in the building trades, they want to see projects like that become a reality. And President Trump, in one fell swoop, is going to make it happen. Where are we on locks and dams? Uh, which, if people don't know, you need to have the locks and dams along the Mississippi because Mississippi is too shallow without damming the water so we can have barge traffic. You know, you're, you're right. And I'm optimistic as part of this infrastructure plan that the president's wanting to implement, that we can finally see some movement on the upgrades and extensions of the locks and dams along the Illinois and Mississippi rivers. Terry, you and I have known each other a long time, probably 20 plus years. I remember 20 plus years ago, sitting in Quincy, Illinois at a hotel ballroom when the Corps of Engineers and, and local interests pick which plan that the Corps was gonna use to actually implement these changes and these upgrades. Well, 20 plus years have gone by and we haven't seen any any progress. And the fact that they were talking about it 20 years ago was that these dams needed to be replaced then. Exactly. And uh, people should understand that the United States economic abilities are falling behind the world standards. We only have 600 foot barges when they should be 1,200 feet, uh, the ability to do it. So we're in many ways crippled because our infrastructure was from the 1940s. You're absolutely right. And we've been maintaining 1940s infrastructure rather than implementing a long-term plan to build new. Now, we've had some new construction in southern Illinois with the Olmstead Lock and Dam that has been a disaster. You know, my goal is to That's actually... That's along the Ohio? It's along the Ohio River, um, and it's cost overruns, billions in overruns. It just shows you the inefficiency of the Corps of Engineers to actually get back to their mission, which made them great, which was building our nation's infrastructure. Uh, my goal uh, as a member of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee is to make our system better. You know, barge operators and customers pay into what they call the Inland Waterway Trust Fund, and that trust fund has been eaten up by one project. We've got to change the way the Corps of Engineers operates, and that's going to be my goal going into the next two years to actually have a better system in place that's going to take those dollars that are put in by those who use the navigation system to actually pay for the upgrades and pay for the extensions. Yeah, just north of St. Louis, we have the Mel Price Lock and Dam, which is a version of a, the newer dams, right? I mean, yeah, that, and it's uh, like 30 plus years old now. That that uh, you and I and uh, the agriculture chairman at the time, I don't, I don't know if he's still from Oklahoma. He's not. He's still on a committee, but uh, he's not chairman anymore. Uh, but an example of what can be done and yeah. and the amount of time. People think that's just for agriculture. I will let people know that, I mean, the United States makes billions of dollars in profit by moving coal and our agricultural products down the Mississippi to the port of New Orleans for export to the world. But also we bring jet fuel up the river so that planes can be taking off at O'Hare Airport. So it's, it's critical that uh, these things get fixed. Well, so, it, you know, people think politics is arcane and that it doesn't necessarily impact them. And I, I would hope that they could see through some of these issues. This stuff does sound, uh, you know, distant from their lives. But every time you go, uh, you know, to, to get gas and things, I mean, this stuff is impacting well, when you stand on that lock and dam, at lock and dam, Mel Price or, or, or 27 or wherever, and you watch, you, you watch those barges go through the lock, and you see what's, what's on those barges. You see the coal. You see the agricultural products. You see the manufacturing products. You realize that that mode of transportation, our navigation system, gets our products, be it ag, be it manufacturing, uh, whatever you want to put out into the transportation sector, it goes in a very cost-effective way down the river to the Gulf of Mexico and out into our open oceans and into the global marketplace. We can't continue to feed the world like we do here in America without a, a functioning navigation system. Otherwise, it would be cost-prohibitive and also much less environmentally friendly to move those products by truck versus barge. I would also point out to people living in central Illinois, we have ADM, we have uh, state, well, this, it used to be Staley, but these food processors, the people from ADM a couple of years ago uh, in a conversation with me were saying, you know, we can go to Brazil where the land is cheaper, the labor is cheaper, uh, the growing season is longer, but the United States has better transportation infrastructure 
but they added, we're losing that edge. And when we talk about bringing jobs back to America or holding on to what we have, these are some of the critical components. They, they may not be as sexy as any number of the social issues that get people riled up, but as far as impacting people's lives day to day, they're, very, they're critical. Very much so. And, I, and I'm glad President Trump recognized that not only in his campaign, but also is continuing that campaign promise and moving toward fulfilling that campaign promise in his administration. On Im so you're on agriculture. One of the big things in agriculture, let's get to immigration. There's two components, at least two components. There's probably 10, but let's focus on two. One, one we, we tend to think about the immigration coming from uh, our southern border across Mexico and the president wanting to build a wall. I want to know if you're in favor of the wall and your thoughts there. The other is the uh, moratorium on now six nations uh, from around the Middle East where the Trump administration was saying the basically the central government of these six nations has uh, collapsed so there's no way to properly vet. That's their argument. Where do you stand on Let's take each, each, but uh, pick whichever one you want to start with. Well, first off, uh, the president is doing what he said he was going to do in the campaign. He wanted to focus on the southern border for border security. Um, what that final plan looks like, I, I don't know. I, is it going to be a, a, a concrete structure, you know, the entire stretch like it is and certain stretches in and around San Diego, California? There's going to be a virtual wall. What, what are we going to do? We'll see the plan come out before I can take a stand on whether or not I'm supportive of that issue. I'm supportive of securing that border, and that has to be a first step in any comprehensive immigration reform package. But we also have to address where the majority of illegal immigration actually comes from in this country. And ironically, it's not the southern border. That's one portion of it. We actually have to address the illegal immigration that comes through our airports and our ports. Individuals who come here legally on, on uh, visit, uh, visitor visas or student visas, and then they overstay. And the federal government's not equipped to find out where they're at. That has to be addressed too. And when we do that, we can also address some of the problems we have with our immigration system, be it the, the uh, H-1B visa program, the H-2A program, the H-2B program, the EB programs. That's when we can really make our immigration system work for everyone. I thought it was pretty telling. I don't think anybody expected President Trump in his joint, in his speech to a joint session of Congress just recently would bring up immigration reform outside of border security. But he talked about actually having a merit system like Canada does. And I don't think that's a bad idea. We ought to make sure that the immigration policies we have in place actually go to make America's economic engine and our systems like our healthcare system or agricultural sector work better. And not at the expense of American jobs, but to fill those jobs that we have the need for. <clears throat> Time's always short and we can never get to all the issues, but one other thing, the U.S. military has been decimated by uh, some of the cuts that have happened over the number of years. There was just a story out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky, about uh, they, they basically can't do what their mission is anymore because they don't have the planes and the manpower and some of the buildings on there. There's an order of no more maintenance on the buildings. Sure. The president wants to spend $54 billion. Uh, some generals have said that's a good start, but it's not even enough that we ought to be spending twice that to get back to where we need to be uh, and $100 mil billion over the next four years. Uh, have you thought much about this? I know you're not the, on the military uh, side of things, but just as a member of Congress, do you, what are your thoughts on rebuilding the military? Absolutely, I have. And our, you're right, our military has been decimated through sequestration and through other, other measures that were passed before I got to Washington. Um, I'm anxiously awaiting the president's budget to see what he intends to do with other um, portions of the discretionary budget that, that our nation's military falls under. And I think we have to look ahead. You know, we have to look ahead at how do we address the overall issues of our debt and deficit in this country. And the best way to do that is through economic growth. So we've got to not only talk about investing more in infrastructure, but let's, let's actually invest more in the American people through things like tax reform and health care reform that's going to serve all Americans and allow every American the access to care and make it affordable because we have so many Americans right now that can't afford to buy coverage 
or can't afford to use the coverage they have with $6,000 deductibles. 31 million people in this country are still uninsured, can't afford to use the coverage they have. Let's allow people to get the jobs and the careers that they want through economic growth. Then we're going to see our deficits erased and we'll be able to even invest more than what the president wants in rebuilding our military and also our crumbling roads and bridges. As we tape this, I should have brought this up earlier, but let me have you comment. The, the, the Congressional Budget Office is going to come out as we tape this today on, on the 13th uh, with their score. They're going to project what the president's health care bill uh, would cost. Should we care what the CBO says? I mean, when you, one looks back over the years, they've been so off in their projections. Uh, <laughs> frankly, sometimes it's, it's fiction reading. Yeah. Well, keep in mind... Uh, the only people that use the CBO scores are the ones who actually agree with them. And then when they come back uh, out of the Congressional Budget Office and, and uh, no one agrees with them, no one uses them. Uh, look at Obamacare, for example. The CBO projected, I think, what? It was going to cover 21 million uninsured uh, people in this country. Actually, it only ended up covering about 12. And they uh, also projected it would uh, lower the deficit where the costs have skyrocketed. The costs have skyrocketed. Um, we still, again, have overall 31 million people uninsured or underinsured still in this country. So the status quo is not acceptable. I'll give you an example of the CBO. I'm anxiously awaiting the score on this health care plan, and, and we'll see what it means. But I helped write the Farm Bill a few years ago, the Farm Bill of 2014. And the CBO projected that our policy changes in that bill would save $23 billion in mandatory spending over the life of that bill. And... That was the, still the largest single spending cut that we had projected in my entire first term in Congress on the mandatory side of our ledger. Well, in reality, over the last three years, that farm bill, those policies, those words on pieces of paper that we changed have saved taxpayers $104 billion in mandatory spending. The CBO was off that much, you know, almost 75%. And in a relatively short amount of time. In three years. Yeah. We still have two more years of that bill left. So take that into consideration when you see these scores come out. And we'll make sure that we put good policies in place and put them into law that will hopefully emulate exactly what we saw with the farm bill. I will tell people that who are not political wonks, they should pay attention because when we look back since the Second World War, this is one of the most interesting periods of time, I think, in American political history, uh, given the Trump administration, given that the American people have handed the ball to the Republican Party to, to do with it what it, it will. And as you just said, a lot of these things may just be words on paper to some people, but their impact is significant one way or the other in cost, in health care, in job creation. Uh, so they need to pay attention. We appreciate you, Rodney Davis, taking the time to explain it to us. Thank you, Terry. And I can't agree more. They do need to pay attention. And I'm just humbled and honored. You know, small town kid from Taylorville. I never expected to be a part of this historic moment in our nation's history to be able to, to make some of the tough decisions that I believe our generation has to make to make it better for the next generations to come. Agreed. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks.